Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to the Government Finance Officers Association's training, Assessing Risk Related to Cybercrime. This webinar is approximately two hours in length and worth two continuing professional education credits based on a 50-minute hour. All the participants' connections have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them using the Q&A feature in the pane on the right side of your screen. Staff members from GFA Center are standing by to reply. At the conclusion of the event, you will be redirected to a short survey to evaluate the content of today's presentation. CP certificates will be emailed to all paid participants in approximately two weeks. Our speakers for today are Phil Bertoloni, Bertolo, oh, I'm going to, sorry, Phil. <laughs> and Thanks, Rob. Uh, <laughs> Dustin, you can begin your presentation. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Dan. So I thought we'd start first by just doing a set of introductions uh, for Phil and myself. So, so I'm Dustin Heisler. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for the Center for Digital Government, which is a part of eRepublic. So you might read things like Government Technology Magazine and Governing. Those are all things that kind of fall into our purview. But my background is actually uh, that of government. So I was a CIO and Assistant City Manager for a city outside of Austin, Texas for about five years. And actually before that, I was in the world of finance, the world of banking. In fact, my first government job, I was a CFO of the suburb of Austin, Texas. Uh, so, so definitely a, a big fan of GFOA and it's you know a pleasure to kind of be back in, in the sphere. Uh, so the Center for Digital Government is really a, a, an institution that is tasked with looking ahead and around the corner at trends and, and also bringing those to the surface with state local government agencies across the country. So we work with CIOs, CTOs, mayors, elected officials, finance officers, a whole wide range of things. And Phil and I are kind of partners in crime along with Terry Takai, who is a co-director of the center as well. Uh, and, and cybersecurity is definitely a top of mind thing. And so before I let Phil introduce himself, I also just want to reiterate, you know, you've got us for two hours and we've got about an hour and 58 minutes to go. So we want to keep this really, you know, interactive. We're going to do a series of of kind of pauses to do some questions and answers as we go. So definitely, you know, submit those questions then. We'll try to knock out as many of them as possible. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, we're here to answer, you know, anything that, that may be relevant for your own jurisdiction or things that may come up that, that are related to uh, this whole cyberspace. So, Phil, I'll let you uh, take a moment to introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Dustin, and hi, everyone. And uh, yes, there's an extra O in my name on this slide. I, I do know how to spell my own name, so I don't know how it got by <laughs> me, but it's Phil Bertolini, and I am the co-director of the Center for Digital Government. I spent 31 years in county government at Oakland County, Michigan, which is just northwest of Detroit, and I started my career in the tax assessor's office, or the equalization division, as we called it there. And I worked my way up from an appraiser, and I eventually became the administrator of the division. So I had a great great understanding of revenue and taxation and how that impacted budgets. In 2001, I became the Director of Information Technology and eventually the CIO and Deputy County Executive for the county. And I was part of the budget task force and I worked very closely with our CFO, a very, very, very good friend of mine, Lori Van Pelt, many of you probably know her. And we worked hand in hand and we talked daily about the needs of technology and the needs of managing our finances more effectively at Oakland County. So I just started with the Center for Digital Government last September, and I'm enjoying an incredible team. Dustin is an incredible guy to work with, and we have uh, some, some really amazing people that think out and forward. And Dustin mentioned the Center for Digital Government and my co-director, Terry Takai, and she was the former CIO for the state of Michigan, state of California, and the Department of Defense. And we have a great working relationship, and our goal today, obviously, is going to be able to do what we can to make sure uh, you understand cybersecurity and how that impacts you as financial people. So, Dustin, I'm going to flip it back to you, and we'll take it away. Great. Thanks for that, Phil. So, from an agenda standpoint, I mentioned, you know, we've got lots of opportunities for some interactive conversations. So, we're going to start first by diving into just the issues and trends as it relates to cybersecurity. You know, we do a whole series of surveys through the center with digital cities, counties, and states, and we have several initiatives for digital communities, as well as digital states through our Digital States Performance Institute. And so, we're always looking at 
how are people responding? What are the big picture trends? So we want to kind of just set the stage and talk a little bit about, you know, the world of cybersecurity in state and local government. And what are the big trends that are out there? How are agencies responding? And then talk a little bit about the future and some of our expectations there. We'll have a series of fireside chats kind of embedded into that. And then we'll do uh, kind of a pause after that big section to just do some Q&A with you all. Then we'll go into kind of the, the mitigation tactics and really, you know, trying to break this down with relevance for you as finance officers, you know, what should organizations be thinking about? How should they be looking at cyber risk and, and how to mitigate those? And, you know, what's your role in the process and, and how you deal with that? And then we'll, of course, start with, you know, some practices on where we recommend that you begin, as well as just some cybersecurity resources that are out in the field that are available to you all. And then we'll call it a day with another virtual Q&A and try to get to, to as many of those questions as possible as we dive in. So we'll go ahead and kick off um, and talk a little bit about cybersecurity issues and trends. And so, you know, we're at this point in time, back, you know, when I was in, in the public sector, um, we, we didn't have, you know, from a cyber attack standpoint, you know, these were things that didn't always make headlines unless it involved, you know, a procurement or something like that. But Fast forward to today, we're kind of at this moment in time where cybersecurity is not just top of mind with state and local government leaders, but it's also something that has more public attention than ever and more media attention than ever. I mean, you know, case in point, when Atlanta was hit with their cyber security attack, uh, you know, someone created a Wikipedia page and kept it up to date with how much they had paid up to that point and, you know, everything about, you know, the, the people that were around it, media covered it. And that's kind of led to an explosion, as you've probably seen, of a lot of press and attention on any type of cyber attack that's out there, whether it's Atlanta, the attack that hit uh, New Orleans. There's a variety of attacks that, that are, you know, continuing to populate. In fact, you know, this is something that when you look at just ransomware alone, this is a map that shows just some of the ransomware attacks that are known right now across the country from municipalities, special districts, like a medical uh, organization, school districts, law enforcement. So, that, you know, there's a ton of, of activity that's out there. And these are just those that have been publicly identified um, as, you know, attacks that, that have actually been released. But there's countless ones that are under the hood of this that, you know, haven't been talked about and, and aren't getting a lot of press. And this is just starting. And you may be sitting back thinking, you know, this is just a big city thing or this is a big jurisdiction thing, but times have changed and now the tools necessary to do a hack or to try to attack or, you know, basically uh, extort money from an agency are easier than ever for people to use. There's the rise of citizen hacktivists and, you know, even some of these anonymous groups like anonymous that, that will hack municipalities just because they feel like they've done something wrong. There's a city in Texas called San Marcos that was famously hacked by anonymous because of a video of an officer uh, punching a woman. And, and so we're in this new era where it doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Uh, government is a prime target for all of these individuals and all of these hacks because you are basically a system of records that you have to have. You have to maintain these. You have to keep these. And so uh, they know that agencies will do everything in their power to protect and ultimately recover whatever that information is. And so this landscape is, is really just starting and continuing to grow in complexity. And the attacks are getting a lot more sophisticated as well. We'll break those down as we kind of get going. But uh, what we've seen agencies do to respond is really start to look at cybersecurity through a new lens. And, you know, most of you have an IT department inside of your organizations, and that IT department will handle traditional cybersecurity. And you might think, you know, well, they've got a firewall and they've got, you know, certain things that protect devices on our network. But now the walls of our agencies are blurring. And, you know, last year we kind of started talking about this notion of community cybersecurity, which is basically securing things beyond the edge of City Hall, beyond the edge of your capital. And that is more relevant now than ever. I mean, think about what COVID-19 has done to the workforce that we have. And now all of your employees are remote or the vast majority are remote. 
And those are all now new threat vectors that we have to start to think about. You know, what happens if, you know, they click on a link in their house? Or what happens if their fridge is infected in a part of a botnet and they connect a government computer to their Wi-Fi network? How will we respond to that? So agencies need to think broader at the whole landscape of cybersecurity from a community standpoint. Um, and so, you know, why is that? Why, why is this important? So outside of COVID, when you actually break down cybersecurity attacks that happen, most of them come from weak consumer devices. And what I mean by that is when you buy uh, a camera to, to track your, your baby or when you buy a fridge that has a cool screen and you can write notes on it, all of these devices are internet connected. I mean, I have a washer that will now text me when it's done. So it's a great convenience, but it's also a nightmare from a cybersecurity standpoint, because these devices themselves have very weak standards embedded in them. And most of the time when you buy something like that, you never actually think about changing some of the default passwords on your fridge or other things like that, because you don't think it's vulnerable or that it's able to be hacked. But when you break down some of the biggest infrastructure attacks on government agencies that come from these compromised consumer devices and and you know this is becoming a much bigger issue and we're going to start to see more sophisticated usage of this i mean think about in terms of you know many of you might have a program with your respective agencies to subsidize the cost of like a nest thermostat or another wi-fi enabled thermostat and a lot of agencies that have those partnerships do it not just because of energy efficiency, they do it so that they have the ability to either raise or lower the temperature during peak utilization to prevent blackout. So it's, you know, a pretty good model when it comes to that, but that same infrastructure can be flipped around and used to create blackouts. And so we're going to start to see, unfortunately, more of these use cases as we progress and as these tools become easier for attackers to use. And so it's more important than ever for us you know, in, in government, state and local government to, to understand where the attacks are coming from and to think about what we can do to mitigate our digital risk associated with that. Hey, so Dr. Like before we, got, we, before yeah, we go to that poll on that last slide, you know, when you talk about the different devices that are out there, something to think about from a local government perspective in a county government is when you start looking at intelligent street lighting or the ability to do intelligent signage in your right-of-ways for maybe a downtown area. And could you imagine if someone could hijack that message if you were trying to, during an emergency, trying to flow people out one end of town, if they were mm -hmm. able to turn the arrows around and cause the entire thing to be upset. So this is the, and what I want to do is just drive this point even farther because all of you that are out there thinking of Internet of Things and connected devices and things that you want to do in your communities, just remember that's why it's important that you have the proper cybersecurity play in place and the proper protocols to make sure that someone can't hijack what you're trying to do. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I think that's a, that's a really good point. So we'll dive into the world of smart cities right after this poll question. So uh, here's a quick poll question for you all based on what we've talked about. What will be a new government service? Will it be national cybersecurity, community cybersecurity, or federalized cybersecurity? So lock in your votes and we'll move on to the next section. So Phil mentioned some of the, the smart cities aspects of things. And I know many of you might be, you know, in a city that has launched a smart city plan or is actively working on that kind of infrastructure from, you know, smart street lights to, to other things. Uh, and so it's important just to understand from a consumer standpoint how uh, people are are actually hacking agencies today and and you know just how easy it is to actually do things. And so one example, kind of a fun example is uh, a kid, this was actually a teenager used his smartphone at the Mall of America to steal a Tesla. And so when you think about you know that use case, you may say, well, that has no relevance to government, but it actually increasingly does. Uh, and in case in point, you know, if someone steals your identity, um, where do you go? Well, you probably go to a local police department in the city that you live in and you ask them to, you know, write up a case for it and, and they know exactly how to investigate that. Now, if someone hacks into your Tesla using their smartphone and then they, you know, put it in self-driving mode and drive off into the wind, what do you do? So these are all becoming more state and local government issues that we're going to have to deal with. 
um, from, you know, from a variety of different purposes. And so we'll kind of continue to break those down. Smart cities are incredible opportunities for cities to leverage infrastructure to do new things, but they're also kind of a, a, a whole playing field of, of potential risk for you. Um, you know, if your connected street lights are a part of a hacked network and that network attacks you know, a piece of mission critical infrastructure, or maybe it's directed to attack an industry, who's responsible, who's liable for that? So these are all questions that are kind of in this gray area of cybersecurity law and, and case law, which is kind of limited around government liability here at this point. But these are things that will be determined and defined as we kind of dig into this and as more and more cities start to build this infrastructure. So we have to think about the risk of operating that infrastructure you know, even if it's not just the fact that people are leaking information out, you know, personal identifiable information on citizens, it might just be that your infrastructure is compromised and used to, to wreak havoc on something else that creates a financial loss. So, so a lot of potential things there. So this has pushed cybersecurity really to the top of all IT priorities across the country. And so, um, you know, we do, I mentioned surveys on a regular basis, and I thought it might be helpful to just kind of break down some of the responses that we have in here, just to show you how important cybersecurity is right now at the state and local level. So for the last five years across the board, it's been number one priority uh, for city, county, and state government. You know, followed by it right now, you're looking at city CIO priorities. You've got, you know, citizen experience, disaster recovery, business intelligence, you know, IT personnel, data governance. So, so a lot of other really important issues, but, Cyber's at the forefront, and the challenge has been on this, and Phil and I have been around the country kind of talking about this and, and trying to get agencies to, to see this, is that although it's the number one priority, it is one of the least funded things in government IT. It is less than 2% of the normal government IT budget. So if you took your entire information technology department and broke down their budget with staffing and infrastructure and hardware and everything else, cybersecurity would fall into about 2% inclusive of hardware, software, and managed services. So it is a very reactionary thing from a spend standpoint. You know, if an agency's hit, like when Atlanta was hit, every city around them spiked their cybersecurity procurement to try to make sure that they weren't the next headline or Wikipedia page. And, you know, then it tapers back off and they stop investing. So you'll notice kind of a key theme here is that you know, it's, it's something that you can't do once and forget about it. It's not like, you know, a policy that you're putting in place that, that you know, mitigates your liability. Cybersecurity is an ongoing investment that requires continuous investment to mitigate your digital risk associated with it. And at the county level, it's same thing. Cybersecurity, citizen experience, so you'll notice this trend. And what I wanted to do now, since We've got a county CIO that, that just came out of county government. Actually, it looks like we have a poll question, then we'll dive into an interview with Phil. Uh, so poll question here, cybersecurity was the top concern for, number one, city, county, and state CIOs, number two, city and state CIOs, number three, city and county CIOs. So lock in your vote. And as you do that, um, I wanna start a quick little fireside chat with Phil. So Phil mentioned, you know, he just left Oakland County, Michigan. He was deputy county executive and, and CIO for Oakland County, Michigan. Really built an award-winning information technology program that was recognized, you know, internationally. And, and I think it won every award from the Center for Digital Government that, uh, that was offered at that time. And so, you know, Phil, I think it might be helpful to start just to tell everyone a little bit about, you know, Oakland County, Michigan, and kind of what your dual role was there. You bet, Dustin. And Oakland County, Michigan, because I, I have to tell you one funny story. So I was giving a talk out in San Francisco one year, many years ago, and halfway through the talk, they all thought I was from the city of Oakland. So to be very clear, it's Oakland County, Michigan, which is just northwest of the city of Detroit. And we are the second largest county in Michigan with 1.2 million in population. Well, what we did have was a, a leader there that understood the priority of technology and what it meant to government. And our county executive at the time was L. Brooks Patterson, a good friend of mine and mentor who was always wondering what was next for the people. 
So as I was coming up through the ranks, he uh, recognized my skills in the assessing office and around technology. And when he put me in charge of, of IT as the director of IT, I remember sitting at his desk and him saying to me, I want you to be my director of IT. And I said, Brooks, I'm not a technology person. I'm, a, I'm an assessor. I'm a, I have a telecommunications background from Michigan State University, but I'm not a technology person. And his comment to me was very telling. And this was December of 20, or year 2000. He said, Phil, if I want a business or if I want a technology person to run technology, I have a whole building full of those people. What I need is someone that's going to get the people to use the technologies we build for them. So that became my mission. That became my entire goal was to make sure that we were building or implementing or using the right technologies that the people needed to be able to deliver services to the citizenry. And so when I was elevated to deputy county executive and CIO in uh, Jan January of 2005, he very much wanted me to branch out across government. His opinion why that the CIO should be also be a deputy county executive was that he wanted technology to be at the highest level of decision making. He wanted to make sure that whatever program we had or whatever we were going to put in place was that the technology person was sitting at the table to make sure we could do what we needed to do. So I've been doing that, or I had been doing that since 2005, but what we learned shortly after, and cybersecurity, if you think about it, it was always there. There was always a need to make sure that your technologies were secure, but the issue then became, what are the threats that are happening? You know, you're, you're moving from mainframe systems to PC-based systems, then to the cloud, and so what was that going to mean, and what was that going to take? So as a deputy county executive, he also thought I didn't have enough to do, so he gave me facilities and grounds. And then I, for a while, did economic development and uh, worked with a number of other departments. But what he wanted me to do was to make sure that security was a culture, that we were going to be able to make sure that our people understood what they needed to understand. And we're going to talk more about that as we talk about preparation uh, for cybersecurity. He wanted to make sure that as we use technologies, we were using them in the right way and that we weren't causing ourselves more problems with technology than doing it by you know, manual process. And then he also realized that technology being a foundational pillar of government, there was just no way we were going to get things done if we didn't have strong technology platforms to do them. So my role was to make sure that our organization was always looking at what was possible. It was always looking at what the needs were and then breaking those down and finding the right tools to get them done. So Dustin, you know, having a guy like Brooks as your leader, you know, one, one other funny story, he would go away on these retreats and he'd come back and he would sit in a meeting with all of us in a room and he'd look at you and he'd go, I need to see you, you and you in my office afterwards. And the first thing that came to mind was, oh no, not another project. Oh my God, not <laughs> another project. And we would go in there and he'd have this wonderful idea. And then his first comment back to us was, now go make it happen. He didn't want to prescribe what we needed to do, but he knew that we had the skill sets and we had the people on our team that could make those things happen. So I've enjoyed that role, but understand, and I said this earlier during my introduction, that the CFO, Lori Van Pelt, was right there with me the entire time. There's no way any of this happens. And as deputy county executive, I was able to marshal resources from multiple departments. And there she was uh, making sure that we had the right funding and the right everything we needed to do to make it happen. So my role was great. Um, I enjoyed my 31 years of public service. And now I get to work with you, Dustin, and put this all on steroids. So I'm very excited about where we're headed. Yep, and then we're just getting started. So uh, next question for you is just around, you know, who were your customers? Who did you who did you protect and serve? I know a variety of the people that are probably listening have a very, you know, diverse set of customers. It might be other businesses, it might be, you know, actual citizens that are paying utility bills. Who who were your customers in Oakland County, Michigan? That's an excellent question because there were so many. And it's interesting as the digital transformation took place and as we started moving forward with everything we were doing digitally and online, we, we learned things and found things we didn't know. There was, there was entire processes that spawned because we were able to do things in a more efficient way. When you looked at it, if you broke them down, and, and uh, a good friend of mine, a fellow deputy county executive, Bob Datto, 
he always talked about vertical and horizontal integration of government. And when you think about horizontal integration, you look across your departments and divisions of your organization that might be the clerk, the treasurer, the assessor, the, the sheriff, the prosecutor, and you look across all these business lines and you make sure that you're not building an address database for the health department that is different than the address database you're making for the treasurer's office or you're implementing. So we were horizontally looking across. So we had 82 departments and divisions in county government. We had approximately 5,000 employees at Oakland County government. And those people we needed to be able to serve. We needed to provide them the tools. But then when you look at vertical integration of government, you start looking at cities, villages, and townships. And we started saying, hey, wait a minute, why am I building an address database for the treasurer's office at the county level that's not being used by the treasurer at the local level? So we started driving our integrations into a vertical fashion. One quick story there, Dustin, if I could, is um, we were building a GIS system in the mid 90s and a geographic information system, computerized mapping for, you know, for layman's terms. But there were six of them underway at county government that were being funded by county tax dollars, six different GIS systems that were being built in multiple departments. We said, wait a minute, let's stop that. Let's build it once. And then we looked to all our cities, villages, and townships and found out they were building them as well. We said, stop, we'll build it once, we'll pay for it once, and we invested 10 million at the time, and then everybody will benefit. And to this day, Oakland County has an enterprise GIS system run at the county level that is being used by all the departments and divisions of county government horizontally and all the cities, villages, and townships vertically. What that saved based on our analysis was that if everybody had done their own, First, they wouldn't have talked to each other. And second, it would have been $30 million. The taxpayers of Oakland County saved $20 million and they have a more functional system today. So horizontally, departments and divisions of county government, vertically, we're cities, villages, and townships. We did work with our state, state of Michigan, under Terry Takai. She was the first one to actually walk in my door and say, hey, we need to talk. So we worked very closely to try to integrate and share services. But then you mentioned it, Dustin, it's the people. And the people that were doing business with us as, as county government were the citizenry. They were finding more and more ways to do business with us digitally. We had uh, other companies and providers of services to the county that were doing business with us dig digitally. And then you have the business community in general that was taking advantage of whether it be um, remediation dollars for, for what we call brownfields or contaminated land or whatever it may be. So the customers are everywhere. And as you move more digitally, you're going to find then more and more come out of the woodwork and really need your services. Absolutely. So tell us about your cybersecurity approach. How did you approach cybersecurity in Oakland County? Yeah, that, this was this was a very hit and miss thing at first. And I, and I have to admit, we had a, a number of starts and stops. And at one time, we had some very, very talented people in, on board that said, don't worry, Phil, cybersecurity is taken care of. We have everything that you need. Then those people decided to leave. So I, I had my entire team put them in a room and we started talking about what we had for cybersecurity and it was all over the place. And we said, time out, we need to strategize and have a centralized approach to cybersecurity and it needs to be best practices. So we brought in a chief information security officer, Chris Burroughs at the time, he came in and actually reinvented our entire cybersecurity platform and portfolio. And we started looking at not just how to protect, but also that ability to be able to recover. And I know there's so many different steps to cybersecurity, and we're going to talk more about that as well when we talk about frameworks. But the ability to, to stop an attack is only one part of it. The ability to recover from that attack afterwards and close the holes is another. So he rebuilt that entire platform for us, and it became very much about everyone. It took everybody to make sure our county was secure. That, would, that included cybersecurity training, a number of different policies and frameworks had to be put in place. And it took a number of years to do it, but we ended up getting to where I could actually sleep at night. <laughs> and I know that some CIOs will tell you what keeps them up at night, the worry that they're gonna get hacked or breached. And that's very true. But we were able to do what we had to do. So we, could, we created kind of an onion approach where we layered security around all our systems. Then we just started looking at best practices of how to monitor and prevent intrusions. And then we also looked at the endpoints or the end users where, and last I had heard, and Dustin, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
somewhere north of 80% of all cyber attacks are people related where someone has done mm -hmm. something like give up their information or clicked on the wrong thing. So there was a number of ways we had to attack it, but it came down to training those 5,000 employees to make sure they didn't do things they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, I think you're you're right on there. So, you know, what kind of guided your approach? Did you have a codified strategy or, you know, I know a big challenge for a lot of cities is just finding funding to to actually right. do it. So, how did you prioritize your cybersecurity activities? That's an excellent point because funding became the problem. You know, when you have an entire portfolio all planned out and your strategic plan or your master plan for IT is already planned out, it's hard to stuff the cybersecurity thing into it. So what we did is we made the hard choices. We actually stopped some of the programs that were underway and projects that were underway. We looked at some of our support dollars and we were at one time running about 86% support and maintenance to 14% discretionary or new development. That's way skewed. If you're running that high of a percentage, you need to work on that. Our goal was 70-30. And before I left, I think we were at 69-31. But then what that does is by, by reducing your support dollars and finding unique ways to support your infrastructure, you find other dollars that become freed up that you can use for cybersecurity. And then we had to go to our governing body and ask for money. It's, it's one of those things I never thought I'd be able to get a presentation where I could ask for a couple million dollars from our board of commissioners and not be able to tell them a lot of detail in an open meeting. But we were able to do it because we had built trust with them. Our CFO had made sure that we knew where the money was and that we could go get it when we needed it. And then we put the controls around the money to make sure that it wasn't being spent on anything but what it was slated for. So that was important. But I think the other piece of it, Dustin, was to get the buy-in with the executive leadership. It's hard to prepare for things that may never happen. And at the time, when we were doing this in early phases, things weren't happening to government as much as they are happening today. But you all out there listening to this webinar have the opportunity of a lifetime. This stuff is happening so fast and furious. And as Dustin said in his opening, they're targeting local government. So if you can find a way to get those funds, now's the time to get them. Absolutely. So I know another question that we often get a lot, and you know, we we both kind of have dealt with this in our careers as well, is just how do you know if you're doing the right thing. How do you know if your approach is actually working or not? You know, is the is the sole mechanism of evaluating cybersecurity uh, the fact that you haven't been hacked, or how, how do you approach that one? That's it. What's the definition of success, right? I mean, <laughs> well, how, how do we know we're doing the right thing? And and it's not if you're going to get hacked, it's when. And there were a number of breaches when I was there. It's just we caught them quick enough to where no damage was done. And uh, whether they tried to stop us from operating in denial of service, we were able to do what we had to do. But the success is, and, and I don't mean to oversimplify this, the success is that you're not on the front page of the local paper. And that's not easy to do because even a small breach is going to make big news, but it's what you do with that breach after it happens. And so when we were investing the money, we actually created an assessment we called SciSafe. And and we can talk more about that later when we start talking about how to do things. But we started assessing ourselves objectively and we were doing it each quarter. And I was able to bring back objective changes to our portfolio and our, our cybersecurity posture to our leadership and say, look, we're making headway here. The problem is, and you said it earlier, it's changing so fast. There's just really no way to stop it all. So I always use this one story and I might as well get it out of the way before I forget it. So here, ready? So, you're at the campfire with all your friends and you're, you're sitting there and you're, you're talking and a bear runs into the campfire and you all run away. And the question always gets asked, do I have to be faster than the bear? And the answer is no, I have to be faster than the slowest person in the group. Now, I know that's, you know, kind of a, eh, it might be a little bit funny, but the whole reality is, is you're trying to be faster than the slowest one in the group. The reason they're attacking local government is because of our legacy systems and some of the holes that we've, we've opened up over time that we haven't been as aware and didn't have the funding to take care of. So if you can put basic cybersecurity protocols in place and controls in place, they will move on. And, and Dustin, you, I think you talked about it earlier too, is a lot of these are automated. 
So they don't know mm-hmm. they're attacking XYZ Township. They're just hitting every doorway they can to try to find an opening. So the goal is to go ahead and just be better than the slowest people in the group. I hate to say that because I know that means there's going to be people that are going to get attacked. Then our goal is governments to jump in and help them. Yeah, and I think you made an important point around the fact that you can't prevent an attack. I mean, a lot of these attacks come from, unfortunately, you know, employees that click the wrong link or, you know, people are taking advantage of even COVID-19 right now. So you kind of have to shift the way that you think about cybersecurity in your organization from one of securing things, which implies that you can put a padlock on something to one that's around mitigating your digital risk. So how do I prevent people from wrecking havoc or causing damage or getting, you know, PII, personal identifiable information from my systems? How do I minimize the impact that they can have and shut it down quickly as Phil was talking about? So you'll notice that's kind of a key theme here as we as we dive into this conversation. And, and you know, another thing that's important too is conditioning your boards. I mean, a lot of times yeah. when a when a board, you know, hears that there's a cyber attack, they assume that someone didn't do their job and so the first person to get cut is either the, the chief information security officer or the chief information officer. And, you know, it's 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 not that they actually could have prevented the attack. It's it's what happens after the fact as Phil was talking about. You know, Dustin, it's interesting you say that because it is all about risk. And I think we lose sight of that. We consider this to be just a technical problem, but it is a risk problem. It's a risk to running mm-hmm. your business. It's a risk to everything else. And, and you know, we could take all of our computers, wrap them in bubble wrap and bury them in the ground, and they would be totally safe. But they won't be useful. So what is the balance of that risk so that you can still use the technologies to deliver services at the same time keeping everything secure? And that management of that risk becomes everything in the end. Exactly. It's just like safety with utility workers. You know, you've got to run safety programs to, you can't prevent accidents, but you want to minimize or try to mitigate them from happening and the severity of them if they happen. So absolutely same approach. So I know another thing that we've talked about is around kind of the data privacy, um, you know, even some of the, the data management legislation that's been popping up. We've been tracking a lot more uh, from a legislative standpoint that's starting to impact some of these state and local agencies. How did you keep up with just the legislative and policy changes? Yeah. Well, the CIO became a compliance officer all of a sudden. It's, it, you know, you have CJIS, which is Criminal Justice Information System. So that's an FBI uh, compliance issue. Then you have GDPR, which is the you how to do transactions, and then I believe that started over in Europe. And and you have all the different things, HIPAA, you know, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, where you're dealing with health-related information. So pretty soon the CIO became a compliance officer. And we had to find ways to make that happen. So what we ended up doing, I wish I could say that we had the right people in the house to be able to handle all that compliance. We just didn't. And what we had to do is we had to go find experts in those fields to make sure we were doing what we had to do to comply. Because if you get a violation under HIPAA, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in impact to your your government budget. So who's managing that? Who's watching out for it? And then as we started to push towards the cloud, the issue of what data was where and what cloud do I need to be in? and, And do I need to classify all my data sets or just some of them? And so it was very difficult to keep up with all the changing world, but I understand when things happen in legislatures and they happen in commissions where they try to solve a problem, they don't always listen to the practitioners that are out there and say, hey, if we make this statute, you know, uh, something that needs to be complied with, are you able to even do it? But for the most part, if you do, if you have good cyber hygiene and you take maybe your most stringent uh, compliance issue that talks about how to manage data whether it be personally identifiable information or it be criminal justice data, whatever it may be, if you get to the most stringent and you manage your data sets that way, then you're going to be better off. But it is definitely a difficult problem. There's definite dollars involved here. So there's a cost, and the finance officers on, on, that, on this webinar should you know, listen up on that because there's going to be a cost to it, and it's going to be a cost that you're just going to have to bear because if you do get breached, the cost is much higher. Well said. 
And my last kind of fireside chat question for you in this section is just around what you've seen change. You know, you, you've now been kind of on the private sector side for over a year now. How have you seen the cyber landscape change around uh, government? Well, it's getting faster and faster. I, I remember listening to a, a young person talk about when they were playing college football and they were getting ready to go to pro football. And when they made the, a pro team, they got out there and they were struggling and they said, wow, the game just got a lot faster. Well, the same things happened to government IT. It's, it's gotten so much faster. And the skill sets that we have and the ability that we have to solve that, we're, we're struggling. And, and government needs to think about how to retool itself or retool its skill sets or find the right private sector partners out there that can come along. The other thing I've seen, Dustin, in, in the world of IT is that the private sector partners are now more ready to help us than they ever could before. I remember when cloud computing was, was the big rage and, and we were trying to go to the cloud, but we just didn't have any partners we could lean on to help us get there. Now you have all this software as a service out there. You have people using private clouds and government clouds. And now you have resources that you can tap into that you didn't have before. The important thing is to know what you don't know, that if you don't have the skill sets internally, to make sure you get the external ones, because I think the pace of change is dramatically different. I think the skill sets that are required to run IT, if, if you look at IT from when I started to now, there were more programmers and database administrators and those type of technical networking folks. Now, probably more than half the staff are business analysts, project managers, and the people that are working with the people to get things done. And then the technology just becomes the tool to do it. So I think that's been a big shift. And then the CIO shift, I hate to say, is I, I worry about the CIO role, is that some governments are saying, well, we can regulate technology to a lower level in the organization. That's wrong. You need to push it up higher in the organization to make sure they're making the right decisions when, when the programs start and when they need to move forward. All right. So that brings us to our next section. So I know we talked about kind of city, county priorities from a technology standpoint, um, but we're gonna also talk a little bit about the state level. Um, I know this graphic, it looks like is a little chopped off on the slide, but basically cybersecurity, number one priority, shared services are more important. Then you get into like cloud computing and uh, IT personnel, business intelligence, analytics, those types of things, but you know, across the board, Again, uh, cybersecurity is, is the number one uh, priority. And it's also forcing a lot of legislative response. So we talked about kind of the, the, the policy changes that are happening. You know, we track states that were in session last year. Um, and at the end of the year, there were about 273 individual cybersecurity bills that had direct application to state and local government. So that's a significant thing. I mean, that's now 273 potential things you have to comply with. Uh, depending on your state. And, you know, this landscape is getting more complex. You've got states like California that are regulating, you know, all the way down to how uh, the default passwords have to be changed on consumer devices. You've got Colorado and in, in, in their kind of Consumer Privacy Act, and, and California actually has a very similar version of that. Um, and, and so these are all new areas that we have to comply with, that we have to, you know, basically um, kind of check the box on every year and really look at how they're changing. We fully anticipate that probably within the next 24 to 36 months, the federal government will start to connect some of these individual state policies, and we might see a national policy that's equivalent to like a, a GDPR, uh, as Phil mentioned in the UK. Uh, that was a, a policy that was put in place that basically allowed people the right to be forgotten. And so they could go to a business or, a, you know, Google or, or any type of company and say, I want you to expunge any data you have on me from your systems and these businesses would have to comply. So it pushed, pushed a lot of control to the consumer bracket. But then, you know, the question is raised, what does that mean for government? You can't just forget someone. You have to, you know, have their records. You're subject to a variety of different laws around records retention. And so, this is definitely an area that will will face a lot of uh, of uncertainty um, as we go forward. But just know that states are moving on this, and and these you know frameworks and these legislative uh, you know regs can provide some levels of guidance. But it's again not a silver bullet to liability. You have to still 
go well beyond that, and we'll continue to, to dive into that. So cybersecurity, you know, the net net of all of this is that it's a function that's expanding beyond just the traditional walls of government. It's not just about securing devices inside of your network. It's not just about operating a firewall. It's really a new initiative that is everyone's responsibility, not just the CIO, not just the CISO, and, you know, it's the CFO and the city manager, county manager. So it's really a function that everyone has to be involved in in order for it to really work and in order to really mitigate risk. And we are seeing lots of bright spots across the country as it relates to approaching cybersecurity. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of collaborations in, in kind of industry consortiums. Arizona launched a cyber task force, which I think is a good model that would work even at the local level, which brings basically together businesses, you know, academic institutions, state and local agencies, and they're able to talk about cybersecurity from, you know, the state of Arizona perspective, and they're able to share resources and intelligence and other things, and, and these things will be increasingly important as we go forward because we all are facing this complex threat uh, environment, and so if we're going at it alone, we're all learning alone, so we have to find ways to build these bridges and become smarter as we go. Uh, New York City launched, um, this has now been about 18 months ago, something called NYC Secure, which is basically a mobile app that the city provides to citizens that allows citizens to test their own Wi-Fi networks. It will test, you know, to make sure they have the latest version of iOS or Android. Um, it, it also is kind of used as a way to uh, train them on proper cyber hygiene, so basically good practices. Now, you might be thinking, well, why would the city do that? And again, you know, most of the attacks against government are coming from hacked consumer devices. So this is one way that an agency is trying to mitigate some of that risk with people around them. Um, so, you know, a, a great initiative out of New York City. So some predictions for the future and what we see, I mean, this landscape continues to exponentially evolve. We've talked about ransomware, and we're gonna dive into that a little bit more so in just a moment. Ransomware is gonna have a much bigger impact on consumers. Right now, it's an inconvenience primarily targeting healthcare, state and local government agencies, federal government agencies, basically anything that would have to pay because they have a legal requirement to maintain those records. Now, consumers haven't been hit with ransomware as much. You've, we've seen some private sector companies like Sony and others that have been hacked with it. But what will happen when you get in your Tesla and it's been ransomware uh, and you have to pay, you know, some payment in Bitcoin in order to unlock it? Um, this will start to force an even bigger legislative response to cybersecurity, so it's important to start to get ahead of the curve on that because it's going to have impl implications on us in the state local market. Social engineering is also really um, becoming more complex and sophisticated. And, it bas and basically, you know, social engineering, uh, for those of you that remember Kevin Mitnick, uh, he wrote the book, The Art of Deception. He was a very famous hacker that actually didn't use computer code to hack. He used social engineering. He would call and impersonate someone in order to get something. So he famously did that to Motorola and was able to get them to send a bunch of sensitive, you know, information to him. And so this is a real big wave right now uh, at the state and local level. So you, there's been several school districts as well as agencies that have been hit with this. Now the way that this works is that typically someone will impersonate a contractor that you have a pre-established payment schedule with, and they'll call you uh, and they'll say, hey, I need to change our deposit information for the next payment. Um, they may take signatures or list signatures off of an open data portal that you have that has some previous documents in there, and they'll you know, send, here's our new routing and payment information, and before you know it, your next payment is going to an account that is actually not the contractors, but it's someone else's and they've cleared it out. So agencies have lost millions of dollars with this. Now what's making this so much worse right now is a lot of times the people behind it aren't actually people anymore. They're actually computer programs. And so artificial intelligence is playing a more important and more um, critical aspect of those attacks. And so it's basically lifting information about, you know, your org chart and other things, and then just impersonating that individual and 
you, you might notice emails that sometimes slip in saying, hey, you know, it looks like it's from whoever your executive is. I need you to do a favor for me. If you engage them, they'll say, I need you to, you know, go run out and buy gift cards for this thing that I'm doing. And, you know, before you know it, you're out, you know, $5,000. So, so these attacks are also uh, on the rise at the state and local level. And I would argue, you know, more and more agencies are facing far bigger losses from these because these, uh, these AI systems are getting more sophisticated at tacking on uh, or leveraging existing data on payment schedules. And then, you know, the last thing is just that it's so much easier to actually hack someone today. So this is a screenshot from the dark web, which is basically, you know, a, 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 the internet in a, in, a, in a harder to find way. It uses a, a network that is uh, kind of anonymous. Uh, so there's a variety of ways to get into it. These networks were primarily used for, you know, drug trafficking and, and other types of trafficking. But now you can, you know, go online and you have a shopping cart. You can, you know, actually say, I want to take down a website. I want access to, you know, this type of system that will allow me to overwhelm a government website for a month. And I can pay $34.99. I probably wouldn't pay with PayPal, but you can pay with Bitcoin. Um, and people now can just attack an organization with the click of a button and sometimes the shopping cart technology is actually more elegant than government payment systems. So this is the new reality and you think about this in the context of why agencies are a target. It's not just for money but it's also because when people get frustrated they no longer call and wait on hold or you know send an email to the city manager. Now when these citizen activist groups get frustrated they may decide to just take matters into their own hand and try to disrupt your operation. So there's a variety of different ways that they're doing that, but tools in the dark web are easier than ever to use. And there's a lot of government servers that are also available in the dark web. You can pay as little as $7 to get access to uh, compromised state and local computer networks that they may not even realize are on there. Um, you're just not supposed to change the password and you're supposed to access it at night. So this is the new reality that we live in and the threats that we have to protect against. So now let's talk a little bit about the types of cyber attacks. This is a great graphic uh, that was in Forbes that I think illustrates a lot of the different vectors that are used. The ones we hear the most about are related to malware. So ransomware kind of falls into this bucket. And this is, you know, basically any type of system that's designed to either damage control or encrypt a file system on a computer uh, as a far as a part of that attack. And so it gets into your system a variety of different ways. Uh, a lot of times email phishing is, is one way that that is, is done where basically someone will send an email that's designed to get you to click on a link, it looks official, or it, you know, the Oakland County is buying Amazon Prime for all county employees, click here to activate this membership. And before you know it, you've been, um, you've introduced a form of malware into your system that's designed to spread. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. You've got man in the middle attacks, which these are a little bit more complex. They, they require physical proximity to either an agency or to a, a, a third party that you're dealing with like a bank. So there have been some attacks that have leveraged this state and local level. Basically, you just have to be close to one of those parties and you intercept, the hacker will intercept your traffic if it's not secure. Uh, and they'll uh, use that to either siphon off personal identifiable information or they may use it to, uh, you know, get you to log into a bank. They do a wire transfer while you think you're seeing a loading screen and before you get fully in, they've already, you know, kind of backed out of it. So that's another thing. Uh, there's a variety of uh, kind of malicious code injection technologies that take advantage of vulnerabilities in browsers and computers from cross-site scripting to SQL ejection attacks. But another big one is just this distributed denial of service attacks. And that's kind of like the screenshot that I showed you just a minute ago, where basically that's where you are leveraging a network of hacked devices. And you say, I want to send a million of these hacked devices at one time to this city's website domain, because I know it will cripple their infrastructure and it won't be able to handle that load. And so a lot of attacks have been focused on that, even as it relates to COVID-19. We've seen a lot of the COVID-19 response websites. People have attacked them and taken them down, which has just made, you know, the problem and the response worse. Um, and so, you know, another, another very popular attack vector for agencies. So, uh, which of the following is not a type of cyber attack? You've got three options here. You've got phishing, you've got distributed denial of service, and you've got WMware. Um, 
So go ahead and cast your votes on that. And we'll move on to ransomware. So this is one of the things I hear the most from finance officials about. They've been hit with the ransomware attack or they know another jurisdiction that's been hit with it. And there's always the question of, do I pay? Do I not pay? How do I handle it? So I thought first, let's just break down where it starts. So it starts first with basically a phishing email. So an email that's designed to try to trick people into doing something. And when they do that something, typically it will run code on their machine that will either uh, install it locally on their machine or begin to just instantaneously spread through the network. And so ransomware basically involves taking your files on your computer and encrypting them. Um, and the key is only available. So the key to decrypt them is only available when you pay the ransom. And so typically you'll see, you know, a, a thing on your screen that says, you know, you've been ransomware. Here's instructions on how to pay us. The ransom is eight Bitcoin. You have until this date to do it, or we're going to leak it, or there's a variety of other things. So that's kind of the first indication that, that, you know, you've been hacked. Now, once you see that, it's important to immediately isolate and remove that computer from the network because ransomware, especially the WannaCry ransomware strain, is designed to replicate and spread. And so depending on, on how your network is architected inside of your government agency, it may spread like a wildfire and start to encrypt everyone's machine, which can be catastrophic. And so some of the most crippling attacks that have happened um, that we've read about in headlines that have taken cities back to paper uh, have happened because their the ransomware spread uh, within their network and basically encrypted multiple machines, including servers that they were operating. So it, it is becoming a, a more catastrophic uh, form of, uh, of attacking agencies. And unfortunately, a lot of agencies are paying. And so that's basically just made this problem even worse because these groups know um, that agencies will pay in order to get their files back. Um, and so that's just created this loop of, of uh, you know, users that have to, to actually pay. So this is, you know, very hot topic today. We'll talk a little bit about some ways that you can shore up your, your you know, risk from these types of attacks. But that's just kind of a quick rundown on some of the key ones that are impacting agencies. And it's not stopping even during crisis situations. I mentioned some of the attacks that are related to COVID-19. Uh, there was one that hit the Health and Human Service Agency. Uh, it was a denial of service attack that, you know, did that. Sometimes they try to do that to, you know, deface websites as well. So it's just growing and becoming harder and harder to keep up with. Uh, some other risks that are related to COVID-19 specifically, you know, have been focused around sending emails related to, you know, medical devices. So like an employee may receive an email saying, hey, we have free N95 mask. You know, the county's offering them to you, click here to claim yours, bam, you know, you've been got. Uh, so you're, we're seeing a lot of that, a lot of people tackling or trying to attack uh, the telework side of things. So as employees haven't had to use a virtual private network or, you know, any of these other systems to log in, they may get an email that looks like it's from their IT department saying, hey, you need to install this software in order to access this application remotely, click here to do it. Or we launched a new collaboration app or video chat app, click here to do it. So we're noticing a lot more of attacks that are focused on, on that and focused on, you know, people that just have weak uh, security in their homes. Uh, and then, of course, there's, you know, a lot happening around the telehealth and, and, uh, and those vulnerabilities that are there. All right, so, uh, so at this moment, we kind of rolled through the first half. Uh, you've made it halfway with us, so congratulations. So we got through kind of what's happening, big picture, some of the, the major vectors that are out there. So this is where we wanted to pause before we dive into some mitigation tactics and you know, answer your questions uh, that have, uh, have come in. Um, and so feel free to submit them using the Q&A section of this console. Um, I know we've got some questions here. So Phil, we'll start with this first one. Um, and I think we can both weigh in on this one. That is, as a non-IT person, how can I tell what's really needed versus uh, IT wish list items? Yeah, it's one of those things where you get you get the big list. It has all the prices on it, and you're like, oh my god, now what? <laughs> the I think a finance person and anybody in a finance officer role needs to expect that a business case and a return on investment accompanies that request. 
And I know that some of these things might not have really deep business cases because they might just be needed for cybersecurity and we need intrusion protection, so we need you to buy it for us. But there should be some sort of documentation or a business case that says this is why we're going to use it, this is how we're going to put it in, and this is how we're going to support it longer term. Because you could put all the technologies you want in place if you don't keep them up to date or support them, they're not, they're, they're no good, you know, maybe a matter of months later. So I think you should require that they talk to you about what they need, talk to you about it in business terms and its effect on the business. And then that in, in turn, you can provide the proper funding for it. Yeah, I think that's, that's great advice. The only thing I would add to, to that is uh, to get them to basically tell you what the expected impact is of those IT investments. So, you know, it's one thing to look at a list that has dollar amounts, but it's another thing to look at the potential impact of those solutions. So how much time am I going to save? Um, how much, how many citizens will this reach? So like, you know, bill pay is a very clear one. If I can pay my bill online, you know, is that going to decrease the number of people that come in and thus reduce my load of potential employees that I need to engage, you know, at City Hall. So have them start to quantify some of that for you um, beforehand. So that way you know specifically what some of the objectives are. And then you have a basis of actually measuring some of those resources that are available as well. So I'm going to send out to the group another thing that I used um, when I was a city CFO that might help um, you. Uh, my government friends may not like it, but it's something called the business model canvas. It also works really good on elected officials. And basically get them to think about any IT project or any shiny object as a business plan. And so the business model canvas is a one page template that's free and I sent you a link to the Wikipedia page. It's a one page template that allows them to put here's what my idea is, here's the value proposition, here's who it serves. But the thing I love about it is they have to fill out here's how much it costs, here's how, here's how I have to support it long term. So it kind of gets everyone to think about the long term impact of maintaining whatever it is. And so for IT projects that I had, I would always have these filled out for each one just to ensure that there was actually a business model around what we were doing and why we were doing it. And so it's a really quick way to do that. It also works really good on elected officials that go to conferences and come back with, uh, with a lot of ideas to, to you know, put it in a structured format for you. So Dustin, also to add on that, you know, they may bring you a solution or as Dustin just said, they'll go to a conference and come back with a solution. But one of the questions that you should ask the technology people do we have other compensating controls that take care of that problem? So they'll see this shiny thing that will take care of 10 items that they're worried about. But the question is, did we already have something in place or was there another tool that we already own that if we had implemented more parts of this tool, will take care of what you're worried about? Because it's really easy to buy new things, but after a while, and Dustin can attest to this, after a while, you buy too many new things and try to implement them, they will start to impact each other. They will start to, to, to slow down your network or to slow down your ability to compute because you have too many things trying to put up too many doorways all at the same time. So it's very important to make sure to find out what the problem is, what do we already have that takes care of some of those problems before we go out and buy something new. Yep, I think that's great. All right, next question that comes in, is there a well-known framework for cybersecurity that I could use to build my own strategy and policy? I'll, I'll take a first crack at that. Uh, there are quite a few that are out there. We're going to talk about one in a moment uh, that was created by NIST, which is a federal agency for standards. So that's a very popular one um, that's used at the federal level um, as a legal requirement. Many states use it. It's a little bit tougher at the local level because it's such an um, expansive framework. Not everything is economically feasible to be implemented, but it's a great reference to use as a starting point. Um, but there's a variety of others that are out there. Phil, any, any thoughts on that one from, from your time as well? Yeah, NIST is great. Uh, there's also, you know, what used to be the 20 critical controls by SANS, they kind of boiled things down a little smaller. Uh, I know that ISO has some controls that they put in place. We at Oakland County had created SciSafe, which you can find at G, the number two G market.com, G to G market.com. It's free, it's an assessment. But what we did is there was 400 of these different controls or, or control points 
and we were able to boil them down to about 38. And I know that the folks at the national level with the MSI SAC, they're working a great deal to make this much simpler for local government. And the MSI SAC um, med uh, membership is free to government. So if you join, they'll identify different things that you can do. They will be there when you get attacked to help you. So there's a lot of ways you can do that, but NIST is the primary one that we used as well. That's great. All right, another question. What are your thoughts on cybercrime insurance? So that is a wonderful segue because later on in the presentation, we're actually gonna talk about cyber insurance and we're gonna talk about the ins and outs. So I'm gonna save that one for a little bit later in our presentation. Sounds great. All right. What role does employee education play in cybersecurity? Well, let me take that one first, Dustin, but it's, it's about raising the knowledge floor. It's about making sure that people don't fall for these scams and these phishing attempts. And we even fished our own employees at times. And I know a number of governments and businesses are doing that, but send them a fake email and see if they click on it. Because the more you educate them, the better off it is. Now, the problem I had was I sent the email from HR. So for several months, no one would open any emails from HR because they got caught in the phishing net. Uh, so you, educating the employees is everything. Build the strong foundation because cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. And, and Dustin, you said it so clearly that these end user devices and things that end users do is where the majority of these attacks happen. And if they're more knowledgeable, they're less likely to click on a malicious link or open an email they shouldn't open. Yep, yeah, I would totally agree with all of that. Um, you know, your employees are the front line for your cybersecurity defense. And so you could have all of the greatest appliances in the world and, you know, everything kind of managed as a service, but if an employee isn't trained on what to look for or what to be hesitant to click on, you know, that can, they can cripple all of that. So they're kind of the, the weakest link potentially within your, your whole apparatus. So it's very important to get them in. And a quick follow-up to that is kind of around elected officials. I know when we think about, you know, elected officials and how we handle them, uh, they go through public meetings training, open records training. Should cyber training be something that we look at for them? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot harder to do though. And I'll just be honest, I mean, some of the toughest people you're gonna work with are your electeds, your judiciary. Um, those folks believe they have a good understanding of this and they may not have the time or they may not believe they have the time to go through cyber training, but it is an eye opener for them just like it's an eye opener for the groundskeeper or the clerical person that they need to know. And, and by the way, they're the ones that are targets. I mean, you know, when they talk about phishing, I remember they used to call it whaling. I think they still do where they go after executives and they go after people of power because they can use their name to invoke some sort of action by someone else. So it's definitely important for elected officials. And quite honestly, you can also invoke this, you know, when, when, the, when you're on the front page of the newspaper or you're on the, the channel, whatever news, that the elected official could be standing there as well. And no one wants to have to be there to say, well, I just didn't do my cyber training. That's why I got ransomed. Yep. Well said. All right. Last question before we move to the next section. How do I keep up with evolving cyber threats? I'll take kind of a first crack at that. Uh, I mean, the best thing to do, one, you know, it's important to look at the, you know, some of those public cases where the media has kind of grabbed on to people that have been attacked. It's important to look at those because it kind of tells you, here's what's happening here. You know, here are the types of agencies that are being targeted. Here's how they were attacked. So anything, anytime you can dive into some of that, that kind of gives you a good litmus test as to what's going on. But I think, you know, the most important thing, or at least how I kept up in the past was just you know, have a close relationship with other agencies that are around you, uh, with your state. So participate, you know, Phil mentioned a variety of different uh, organizations uh, like MSISAC that you can join that provide that kind of critical cyber uh, intelligence for you. And I think it's important, you may think, okay, well, that's IT's role in this, but, you know, as finance officers, it's important to keep up with that threat too, because a lot of these new attacks are targeting you directly. So you wanna make sure that you have 
knowledge of these things that are happening. Maybe, maybe your IT department's passing it on to you, but I think it's really important to kind of keep up with some of the emerging threats, especially around social engineering and some of these uh, larger attacks that have gone after financial infrastructure. Anything you'd add to that, Phil? No, you nailed it. Well done. All right. So now let's talk mitigation. And to kind of lay the stage for mitigation, we wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the finance officer. And, and you know, Phil and I have both been in financial roles, so we're going to kind of go through this fireside chat just to talk a little bit about your role in this entire process. So, Phil, first question for you is just around, you know, those that say cybersecurity is just the function of the IT department. What do you say to this? Yeah, they couldn't be more wrong. It's not just a function of IT and it's not just a technology problem. It's an organization problem. It's a business problem. In the end, someone's gonna pay the freight for all this, whether it's be whether it's up front with the technologies that you bring in to protect yourselves and to handle your response and recovery, or it's afterwards when you're trying to clean up the mess after the attack or the hack has happened. So I I can't stress enough for everybody on this webinar that the finance people need to be at the table actively involved with the technology folks. It's, it needs leadership involvement. And later on, we're gonna talk about the relationships with the different entities of government to talk about their role and what they should be doing to help play in this relationship. Yeah, and so let's dig in a little bit on the finance officer side of things. So, you know, I know outside of them being kind of a, a new target to focus for attackers, what other role do they play in this process? Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, they are they are on the front line. I mean, people are trying to get to the money. That's what they're all trying to do. And I think it's I think it's important for them to be a champion, though, to, of, of the fact that the pre work that needs to happen, all the stuff that needs to happen ahead of time with disaster recovery, with managing your data, with making sure the right, uh, you know, the, the right appliances are in place to protect. They need to be there championing that stuff ahead of time. And I know this has been a struggle in the past because CIOs were always struggling to get disaster recovery money because everybody would say, well, it might never happen. So why would we spend all that money? Well, this is on your doorstep now and it's going to happen. So it's not money that's just being flushed away. This is money that's going to be well spent. And the finance officer needs to be there to help make sure that the right financial models are in place, the right funding sources are in place, and they do everything they can to champion it. So what would you advise finance officials on when it comes to engaging with their IT counterparts? You know, how, how should they engage with them on this topic of cybersecurity? Yeah, this is, this is great because everybody knows that technology people probably aren't the best people people. Oh, I try to say that nice. I mean, sometimes <laughs> technology people can get weighed down into the bits and the bytes, just like financial people can get weighed down into the dollars and cents. And there has to be a way to bring this to a level that you're talking about it as an organization, that you're talking about it as a team. And the best way to approach it would be from the business side. What is the impact on our business? And if the IT person can't provide that, maybe you work together or you bring someone in that can help you with that to make sure that you get a strong business case to move it forward. But be careful approaching them thinking that you might know more about technology because the answer is you probably don't. Now, you know more about finance and they know more about technology. Somewhere, these, these two knowledge sets intersect with each other to make sure that the organization runs. And you need to find that intersection and that ability to communicate so that you're not challenging anyone's knowledge. What you're doing is finding out what the right solution is together as an organization. Well said. So next question is around uh, evaluating cybersecurity as a part of regular audit. So this is something that I started doing where, you know, you have your normal financial audits that are required uh, and, and actually more city bond ratings are actually starting to look at technology infrastructure as an aspect of that. So we started including technology audits with the same audit firm that had those capabilities. Uh, is that something that others should be looking at? Should cybersecurity be something that we audit just like our financial infrastructure? And is it, if so, is that part of the same audit? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it is. I, I think one, some of the financial audits will focus on certain controls, but they tend to focus on those controls as related to the financial system and maybe not some of the other technologies that might mm -hmm. house personally identifiable information. 
So I do agree with you, Dustin. I think this is something that needs to happen and you need to be looking at your cyber controls. The question will be is, can you find an auditing firm that can do both? Mm -hmm. Or do you need two auditing firms that can work together to do it? And I guess the outcome, you know, you know, the whole, what do I do now is once you know the answer, you have to do something about it. So it's not like you can put your head in the sand and say, well, they told me that I had these holes in my system. I'm just not going to fund and fix them. So if you're going to make this part of your audit, you need to make this part of your culture to solve the problems after you've been informed by the auditor that they exist. But I agree with you 100%. This is something that should happen during that annual audit. And if you can find the right firms to do it, you, could, you probably also want to look at physical security now with the way the world is gone, with what, what your buffers are on your key buildings. Um, are you worried about your data center and those kinds of things? You're going to need all those pieces. Absolutely. And, and so for those that ask questions around, you know, how do you cut through what IT you know, priorities actually need to be done. Audits are also a good place to find some of that as well, because you know you can start first with those that that have been exposed to have the highest potential risk on the material organization uh, as a starting point. So, so another good place to look for that. So um, there's been a lot of high-profile attacks that have crippled city operations across the country. You know we've read about them, uh, you know, in, in a variety of publications for for many years now. What have we learned um, uh, from all these attacks? What we learned is they're coming faster than we can deal with them, and they're they're coming in sophisticated ways. And you mentioned it very well earlier on that they're changing so rapidly and they're becoming more sophisticated and they're becoming mechanized. And I think the, the thing that we're learning as government or government is learning right now is that they need to have the right people on the wall. You know, you need me on that wall. You want me on that wall. You need the right skill sets to do that. And if you don't have them internally, you need to find them. If you need to find a company or a private sector partner that can monitor for you and can do some, um, you, know, you know, AI around your logs on your security logs and so on, find them and get it done. So I think what we've learned is that they're coming so fast that you may not have the people to be able to deal with it. And for those of you that believe they're not coming fast and that you do all have the right people and it's not gonna to matter to you, you may have already been hit. Yep, I, I think that's that's right on. And you know, I think the other thing that it, it's exposed is just the need for business continuity and to think about yeah. You know ha what happens after the fact, and you know that's not something IT should just worry about. That's actually something that everyone should worry about. Like, you know, especially finance officers, how do I cut checks? How do I, you know, continue to make payments? How do I deal with HR issues that may pop up? So, you know, there's a whole set of things that I think have been forced into the spotlight right now in response to COVID-19 and everyone working from home. But those are things you should think about in terms of, you know, any type of disruption, whether it's a cyber attack or something else. You know, what do you do? How do you respond to it? So those types of scenario plans are going to be more important than ever. All right, and the last question I have for you here is around, you know, for finance officials that are, that are listening in, you know, what's the best way for them to keep up with how the cyber landscape's changing? Uh, where should they start with that? Wow, well, you know, the GFOA has done a great job of putting together cybersecurity information and, and you and I, Dustin, have been working with them on this webinar and other efforts. Uh, there's, there's obviously resources that are out there for you but you need to make sure it's boiled down into terms that you can understand. And if, if your chief information officer, your chief technology officer can't explain it to you to where you can understand it, you need to get some sort of interpreter in place to do that because you need to have a clear understanding of where you are and how to manage that risk. Because we talked about that balance of risk. And if you don't understand it, I don't know how you're gonna manage that, that uh, financial risk going forward and what you have to do to mitigate it. So it's definitely something to keep informed. We do a lot of government technology and e republic The Center for Digital Government, we're, we're working on some cyber initiatives that we will work on with, with local gov state and local governments. So we're, we're doing what we can. So govtech.com is a great resource. I know Dustin, you put out an incredible resource on the COVID-19 pieces that is sitting on govtech.com right now. And, and our goal, again, as Dustin said earlier on, is the Center for Digital Government is here to try to help get that information out to you as well. 
Great. All right. I think that brings us to our full section around cybersecurity mitigation tactics. So I know you've got some some tactics that you want to kind of roll through with the group. Excellent. And Thanks, before that, it looks like we've yeah. got a, a poll question. <laughs> so, all right, poll question. The following devices can create holes in security. Uh, desktop, laptop, tablet, mobile phone, smart plug, wireless router, or both one and two. So lock in your votes. And we'll move on to why your current technology is vulnerable. Excellent. Thanks, Dustin. And, you know, this is one of the areas, and I'm going to try to drive some common sense here, too, because everybody thinks that, or there are many that think that technology is somewhat secure. And Dustin said something great earlier. He talked about the fact that sometimes we don't even change the internal passwords or the default passwords on technology. And if I remember right, there were a number of states that were, 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 were hacked big time because they didn't change the default passwords in their technology. Well, it's like your iPhone or any kind of smartphone you may have that needs updating. If you don't update it, it's not gonna have the latest protocols. And quite honestly, they don't just update technology just to do it because. There's a reason for it. And you need to make sure that you understand what's happening because the vulnerabilities are there and these devices are all connecting from multiple different endpoints and they can have a direct impact on your operations. So the other thing that is interesting is that, you know, there are holes and there are devices and, and this COVID-19 crisis has really put us in a situation, hasn't it? It's forced many of our employees and our team to work from home. It's forced us to turn what was a desktop environment and mostly an on-premise environment into a remote environment. And all that's happened so quickly, yet all of those devices can leave a hole. If they're not kept up to date, if they're using their home devices, are they, is the cybersecurity or the virus protection up to date? Do they have a firewall? Are they using a virtual private network to come into your technology to do their business? And for all of you that work in your financial systems, it always drove me crazy as the CIO to find out that the data was not encrypted at the database level in some of the ERP systems that were there before, so I had to go do that on my own. Well, nowadays, everybody's starting to figure this out, and they know that these holes are there, and all of these devices are leaving those holes. Now, the other piece of this is that we're constantly changing our internal technologies as well, and a lot of people will call this change management or version management internally, but if I go ahead and update and someone says, I need an update because I need to put new rate tables in for the IRS tax tables, or I need rate tables for my assessing system. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my technology and do that. Well, every time you do that, you could open a new hole. And what I think you need to remember that is that holes open up all the time. You need to be constantly monitoring them. The other piece here is cyber tools are available, but they're not going to fix everything. And there's a ton of them. I always equate this to people throwing things against the wall and trying to watch them stick. It's not how this works. You need to have a strategy in place. You need to have a very thorough uh, way to manage all these technologies and understand how they interplay with each other. And the other thing is that when you buy them, you need to have the right people to implement them, whether you're renting that skill or you have that skill internally. And then when we talk about buying them is one thing, the ability to maintain them longer term is another. So let's talk about cyber insurance. And there was a question earlier asking about our thoughts on cyber insurance. And I personally am a fan of cyber insurance. I wasn't at first though. When it first came out, the market was very immature. And when it came out, they gave us, a, when they first started to push cyber insurance, they gave us a list of all the things that we needed to have in place to have the insurance to begin with. Come to find out it didn't have half of them. I didn't have the proper controls. I didn't have the right uh, monitoring in place. I didn't have the right cybersecurity pieces in place. So before I could even apply for it, I had to understand what was required before they would even be willing to insure me. So you need to have those proper controls in place. You need to understand what the risk is. So what are you risking? Uh, we, the way we looked at risk from Oakland County, Michigan, was we looked at other cyber incidents and we looked at the cost associated with it. And we then divided that by the number of people in their community to find out what that cost per citizen was, and then we multiplied that by our population 
to find out if we had the right controls in place and the right risk being mitigated. And the other thing too is, you know, you don't have to insure everything. Now, cyber insurance is mostly for your digital platform, don't get me wrong, but there's certain data that if they get it, it's public record anyway. So it's, you're not gonna have a breach if they've, got, they've gotten the phone numbers for the departments in your county or city, and they've been able to get those from your website. That's not a breach, because that was public record anyway. So you have to understand what those uh, disparate data sets are and how important they are and how they are classified. So then you have to understand what's covered because some people are running into a problem right now where they have a hack or they have some sort of cyber incident and then the insurance won't cover it because they didn't have the right controls in place or the right processes in place to make sure that the controls were, were, were performing properly. So you need to make sure you understand in the policy what is covered. And then you have to look at the financial decision. So give you an example. Our first cyber insurance policy was $5 million. And then there was a large breach of a large county in the United States. We did that math that we talked about based on what they believed the cost was. And these were health records, I believe, at the time. And then we went ahead and multiplied that against our population and realized we didn't have enough insurance. So at that point in time, I increased it to 10 million and eventually it went to 15 million. Now remember, there's still, uh, there's still gonna be a deductible, understood, but that insurance is there in case you have to really spend some dollars to mitigate the current attack and then to close all the holes that the attack got through to begin with and then potentially close other holes to make sure stuff like this doesn't happen again. So my opinion on cyber insurance, I think it's a good thing. You as an organization need to make sure that you get this going, okay? That it's the right thing and you've got the right controls in place to go ahead and do it, okay? Yeah. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, one thing. I'll, sure. One thing I'll add, Phil, to the cyber insurance thing. You know, this is kind of like think of it like safety insurance, right? Like you have an insurance policy to cover employees that are out in the field, and so you know you hope number one that they don't have accidents, but if they do, you have kind of a blanket of coverage that helps you. So this is an important kind of mitigation tactic on top of that, but this should not be your primary. Uh, cybersecurity plan. So if you have a CIO that tells you their approach to cybersecurity is an insurance policy, you should ask a lot more questions of them going forward. <laughs> yeah, Dustin, I, I love that. That's, that's excellent, by the way. The other piece of that is to be able to look at the actual risk. So you may have a risk mm -hmm. management group that might deal with your insurance policies for your physical assets and your employees. They need to be involved in that because exactly what Dustin said, because if that's your door that's going to you're going to you're just going to go ahead and have a cyber insurance issue every time. Guess what? You won't be insured very long. Yep. The other the, one of the other aspects of this is about outsourcing, and I'm, and I'm not talking about complete IT outsourcing here. But what I am saying is that if you don't have the right skills, you need to get them, and you need to make sure that you've either got them on board or you have them contractually in for a supplemental staffing contract, or you have a private sector partner out there that is just really good at that. And there's a lot of them out there. That if they're really good at it, that you've got them on board with some sort of contract. Now I put the cloud on this slide because I think it's important as we move towards software as a service as government. I know there's still people in government that are scared about going to the cloud or are fearful that the cloud is less secure than what we have on premise. I'm going to go out on a limb and let you know that it's more secure. And in many ways, these large cloud providers have put all the proper security models in place to manage compliance with a number of things that we already talked about, but as well as to protect your data. Now, the other piece of this is that if you're using any kind of email right now in the cloud, you're already in the cloud. You're using a SaaS email provider if you're Office 365, or your Google Mail, or whatever you may be using. If you're using it and it's somewhere else, you're already in the cloud. So the question is, what are you doing to secure that? So make sure that you understand that in your business model for whether you're going to go off premise or into the cloud with your technology, that the right cybersecurity protocols are in place. And then you manage that through your operating expense versus a capital expense for your on-premise um, technologies. Okay, so let's talk about NIST. So NIST is the federal standard. And you can see this, this wheel, and I, I love this diagram because it really does walk through the steps. So we're gonna move right to the next slide, and you can see where it talks about identifying first. And 
you need to identify everything. That means you need to identify everybody that's on your network, anybody that has potential access remotely. You need to make sure you have the right uh, prior, uh, protocols in place to manage identities. So identity access management is gonna be important here. And that you have all the right policies and procedures in place. Something you need to think about as well is you need someone to do an audit of your physical space to make sure someone hasn't brought a Wi-Fi router from home or they've gone ahead and created their own little mini network inside your network. This happens all the time, by the way. And we used to do audits where we would go through buildings and find them. And one quick story there is we found a router and we told them to take it home. And then we came back a week later and the router was still there. So I just cut the cord on it. So I don't know if I totally recommend that to everybody because that person was really upset, but I didn't want them using a personal router on our county network. Next is protect. So this is also where you're limiting who has access to what. Not everybody needs every piece of data. Not everybody needs access to every system. Look at your own ERP system and your finance system. You have power users in that system that do all kinds of things. Well, then you limit the access that they have to what they, as a power user. You don't give everybody in your community the same access to get at what a power user can do. You need to make sure you're patching properly. And I'm not going to go through each one of these individually, but I want to hit the highlights. But patching is important. If you look at some of the major viruses that had happened around the world, some of it is because people didn't properly patch their technologies. If an operating system or, an, or a company says you need to patch, say your Microsoft patches or you have an ERP that sends you a patch, you need to do that because they aren't, like I said, they're not just doing it to have fun. They're doing it because there's some sort of um, hole or something they're trying to go ahead and do. The other, and yeah, I talk about securing uh, wireless access. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Encrypting sensitive data. This is also important, but you notice right here under protect is train your employees. So, so far, everything is pre-work. Identifying and protecting is before anything happens. Now, you're going to be able to detect what's going on. Is the antivirus up to date? Is my spyware and my malware programs, are they up to date? Am I looking at the logs? Logs have thousands and thousands, it could be millions of entries. Is somebody looking at those or do you have a technology that is helping look at those? That needs to be taken care of. And you need to be able to detect what the problem is. Uh, I don't know the amount of days now, but a while back they were talking that some attackers could be in your network over 240 days before they're detected. That means they're laying in wait, watching traffic, watching communications to see what's going to happen. So you need to be able to detect. Next is to respond. This stuff's going to happen. You're going to get attacked. It's not if, it's when. And you're going to potentially lose data, or you're going to get a denial of service attack that's just trying to crush you to the ground and not allow you to do, do your work, or you're going to get your website defaced, or someone's going to do something in fish and try to change a bank account number. You need to be able to respond to that afterwards and be able to do that well. I remember taking media training early in my career where they ran up to me with a camera and they stuffed it in my face and they asked a, a question, what's going on? Why is this all happening? You can't try to fool the media and you can't fool your people because there's so many laws in place today that require you to respond and let people know when you've been attacked. So you need to have that response plan in place and be ready to deal with it when it happens. And then the ability to recover. Some of this, you know, we talked about a little bit about cyber insurance and, and Dustin talked about backups. A backup is only as good as the tape it's on or the disc it's on or the memory it's in. If you don't practice and try to recover from those backups, you could have a serious problem. So don't get caught that way. If you're doing backups, make sure you do periodic tests to use those backups to recover your systems. So then it starts all over again, right? So everything's in a, in a circular motion and it, and it repeats itself moving forward. So we have a poll question. Which of the following is not part of the NIST cybersecurity framework? Destroy, recover, or identify? So you go ahead, we're gonna open this poll. If you could go ahead and jump in and answer. And then what we'll do is we'll move on to the next issue. And we're still on this, but, but this is a great slide because someone asked the question earlier about frameworks and being able to understand those frameworks. And if you look under each of these areas, there's a number of aspects to it. 
No one is expecting you as the finance officer to understand this chart. You should have a basic understanding of those top five categories and what may be underneath them. But your chief information security officer and your chief information officer should be able to explain this. And then each of those areas are areas that you should look to do improve upon. I mentioned the cybersecurity SciSafe assessment. It uses these areas to go ahead and group uh, what you're working on and assessing yourself. And I think you need to understand that as you work through these, you may be at a low level of understanding of some and at a very high level of operations of others. But what you need to make sure of is that you're trying to cover all of them to get done what needs to be done to protect yourself and your systems. Okay, let's talk about preparation and we'll give you some tips first. It's not the sole responsibility of the CIO to protect data. It requires everybody in the organization to do it. And if, if you all remember when HIPAA was a, big, was a big issue, I mean, it's still an issue now, but when it was coming out of the federal legislation or the statute and people were trying to figure it out, everybody was talking about it's a technology problem, it's a technology problem. What they found was it was a people problem, that people were using data inappropriately. They were taking health data and putting it on private devices, or they were accessing health data without securing the ability to get to that data. So this is not just an IT problem, it's an entire organization problem, and it requires everybody to be involved and everybody to be trained. So that's important. So we have another poll, poll who is responsible for protecting citizen data? The CIO only, all staff or city leaders, and you should not get this wrong, <laughs> just saying. All right, Dustin, we'll, while they're filling that poll question out, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, next, we're all really good at physical stuff. And as deputy county executive and I had facilities and grounds and engineering, and I was so good at physical infrastructure because you could see it, you could touch it, you could walk up and see the window was broken, or you could see that a flood had happened or a fire had taken place. You need to treat cyber disasters the same way. You need to be able to see them, understand them and deal with them. Like I said, we're good at planning for physical disasters. We may have tornado drills or we will have hurricane plans in place for if there's physical damage. But if, the digital, if there's digital damage, what are you going to do? You need to have the same planning and the same coordination. You need to make sure that you're backing up and, and recovering the right data. And it, this is interesting. Some people think you have to get everything. And if you look at your disaster recovery plans as a government, you will have to prioritize what comes back first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Not everything needs to come back first. And what you'll find is you'll find that some people will say that public safety data is the most important. Or some others may say we need to get other certain aspects like public health, depending upon the emergency or what's happening. So you need to make sure that you understand what's critical, what's essential, and then treat it like a critical asset like everything else. And COVID-19 has really taught us a lesson here, is what can we get at remotely should also be looked at in case of a pandemic. How many people have business continuity of recovery plans in place for a pandemic? And not many people had because we hadn't had a threat of this kind of pandemic for many years. You need to make sure you have the right money in place. And I'm not talking just right now, saying, hey, I'm gonna give you a one-time infusion of capital money, you're gonna go ahead and do great things with it, you're gonna buy all this stuff, because everything you buy has a life to it, and it has the need to be maintained. So you're gonna to need to make sure that you have ongoing money available. I know that there's a, a serious issue sometimes with finance officers when you when operating expenses go up and capital expenses come down or don't come down as well as they should. And, and I go back to the cloud for that reason because you know operating expense is where when you do when you buy things by the drink or you order them by the transaction, that's an operating expense. Well, some of this work for for cybersecurity is going to be a capital expense up front because you might have to buy an appliance or buy a service, but then there's going to be ongoing operating expenses for people, licensing, maintenance of the technology, or potential operating expense for cybersecurity as a service. So make sure you have it all in place. Then the next is, is the ability to share. And everybody, I think, has a, has a misconception 
not everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but most have a misconception that when something like this happens, we need to close ranks, shut our doors, figure out our problems, and solve it before we can open up and say what happened. You need to open up right away. You need to be able to call the right people, talk to the MSI SAC, talk to the FBI, talk to a local government near you that may have some resources you could use. But you can't do that at the time of the hack. You need to have those relationships in place prior to the hack. So when it happens, all you do is hit the button, go, and call all the right people and get the right people in the door. So be careful that you don't try to make that relationship after something's already happened. It needs to happen before. So when it's happening, you can deal with it right away. Now let's talk about response. So a couple of tips I want to give you about response is, is we're all going to have to understand and realize that we were taken advantage of and that we didn't see it coming. Anybody who's ever had that happen to them in their life knows it's a horrible feeling and you feel betrayed. But cyber criminals don't care and they don't care about our feelings at all. So you need to know that this is coming from all directions. As I said earlier, they may be in there well over 200 and some days and they may be looking for ways to attack and strike at the right moment. And the other piece of this is that it's going to happen so quickly that response time is a, is, is a paramount priority. What I mean by that is you need to limit your response time because the longer it takes to respond, the more damage that's going to happen. The deeper they're going to get or the farther across your network they're going to get and the more damage that you're going to have to recover from. So you need to respond fast and furious. My team used to laugh at me and I always said when we got taught, when we got caught or someone was attacking us, I'd always always say unplug them and let God sort them out. And what I meant by that was, if you got to unplug yourself and shut everything off, do it. Solve it, and then then get then you potentially get back up and operational. But sometimes you just have to stop the attack and do what you can right at the moment. The other piece here that is important is that these responsibilities and relationships I talked about earlier, where you're looking for external help or your neighboring governments to help, you also need to make sure that your internal help is ready too. That if, if an attack is promulgating through your network, that if you need to disconnect, you need your departments ready to be able to do that. Or you need your team to be ready to be out in those departments to be ready to do it. And you need to make sure that those relationships are there so when you're, you're dealing with the disaster, you're not trying to coordinate a bunch of people and activities because that's very difficult as anybody who's been through any physical disasters knows that it's hard to get people into a room and get them to do what they need to do. And the other piece of this is that the government leaders need to be able to there to help make decisions. Even as a CIO, I always said to my team, I'll sit in my office and I have the P card, the emergency P card, and I'm ready to buy anything you need, but you need to come up and, and let me do that and I'll make the decision to buy it. Because the people that are on the front lines and sometimes the CIO is the active person or the director of IT or the finance director in some cases are the ones trying to stop everything. The government leaders need to be making those decisions and make them quick. And they have to have the trust in you that when they make them, you're not, you're not sending them in a, a totally wrong direction. So that's important. And then the single focal point for public relations must be established. And the, the reason we put this here is sometimes too many people talking is bad. And the wrong people talking can be even worse. If someone has a guess on what happened and they talk to the press and then the press runs with it, to come to find out it's something totally different because they didn't get the right information. You need to have a PIO public information officer or a PIO function that when you have a crisis, a digital crisis, that they're the ones that are jumping in and doing what they have to do to talk to who they need to talk to. Okay, so let's talk about relationships. And I'll go through this rather fast because we don't need to spend a ton of time here, but I think there are five relationships that we need to talk about. The administration, technology, legal, procurement, and the team. So let's talk about administration. First, the administration leader or the boss needs to understand the overall mission and strategic plan of why, you're, why technology is even part of this effort. They need to understand that. They need to understand that there's a financial need to secure them. 
So they need to believe at a high level that they get it and they are willing to have work with the financial people to finance it. And then they also need to be able to see how financial plans and the overall mission integrate with each other. So that's the administration or the overall leader. The next one is the technology leader. So it's your CIO, director of IT, could be the finance officer in many cases, but first have a good grasp of the overall strategic plan for technology, and then understand how finance is integrated with the security pieces. And that's why I always respected my relationship with my CFO, because we were constantly talking back and forth about how important this funding was. They should always be looking for business cases and ROI analysis. You should make sure that the technology leader and the technology relationship, those analysis should be there for you. And you should make sure that they're looking at best practices for cybersecurity, that they're not guessing, that they have some best practices, they have frameworks that they're working with, and they're able to do that. And then they also understand the legal risk associated with cybersecurity insurance, and that there are issues that have to be dealt with there. Okay, next, a poll question. So is there a 100% effective solution to cybercrime? Yes, no, or in some rare cases? I'll let you guys chew on that. And we will jump back in to our content while you answer. So the legal leader, I've been a big believer that no matter what I did in technology, that I had finance and legal at the table the entire time. Because there's always a financial impact and there's a legal impact. Are there some processes or procedures or policies we're gonna to have to put in place? Do they understand all the legal issues? Do they understand that the legal risk also needs to be balanced against finance? And how many times have you had an attorney that you work with say, no, we can't do something, and which increased the financial cost of doing it, or they said, yes, we can do it, and you can drop down and um, get things done. And then the other piece of it is the cyber insurance. The legal leader, and sometimes risk management is underneath the legal group, and they need to understand all the risk associated with cybersecurity insurance and what needs to happen to make that happen. Now, the procurement leader, and I put this in here for a very important reason, because during a crisis, as we are in with COVID-19, procurement becomes very important. Do we have the right technologies? Do we have to buy the right appliances? Do we need to provide some sort of SaaS software as a service technology that's gonna allow us to be protected? And how am I gonna pay for that? And so, and how can I procure it? Am I going to change my procurement policies, my RFP process, RFI, whatever it may be, am I gonna change all that? And they need to be able to do that. And they need to change that quickly during a disaster. And then they have to understand any statutory requirements for the impact on procuring that technology. And then the, finally, the team. Finance officers need to be a champion. I said this earlier, and I'm a big believer in it, that the entire team, and I'm talking everywhere from the clerical person on up to the elected official, need to be understanding how important this is, and the finance officer needs to be a champion for doing that. And they have to provide unwavering support for cybersecurity training, because sometimes you may have to mandate that to get people to do it because I've always said this and I'll say it again, and it's on the slide, it's all about the people. It's not just a technology problem, it's a people problem. All right, so that's my relationship talk, so let's talk about where to start. First, you need to look at this from an enterprise perspective and understand, we said this earlier, there's no 100% solution to it and everybody needs to be involved and all levels of government, all, all columns of government, like you know, the uh, legislature, the executive, the judiciary, they need to all be involved and they need to make sure that there's, the enterprise risk management is understood by everyone. Next, explore applying a shared services model. There are people out there that can help you. Is it your state? And there's one of the resources we have for you later, which is a NASIO, National Association of the State CIOs. There's a paper that talks about relationships between states and locals and what's happening around the country. Sometimes you can look to your state or you can look to another local government or some other entity to help you, but do that now. Don't wait until you're in the middle of a crisis and have something like that happen. And then make sure that you're evaluating your cybersecurity protections and plans regularly this is not a sprint. 
This is a long distance race. You are gonna be in this forever and this battle will never be won. So you have to constantly be reevaluating and making sure you're understanding your protections and plans on a regular basis. All right, now finance officers. I put this little chart here for you. So before, and I'll go through it quickly, disaster recovery planning, continuity of operations, perimeter defenses, intrusion, monitoring, employee training, and cybersecurity insurance. That all happens before the incident takes place. During, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're providing financial support to stop the attack, to operationalize the plans that were already created, and finding a partner. You may not have the skill sets, so find the right partner to do it. Notifying authorities, verifying the extent of the attack, procure the technologies to assist, then engage cybersecurity insurance provider. In many cases, you need to do that first, right when this happens. Because if you don't use the right uh, companies or people to help you, you may not get the insurance to cover you. So make sure you understand that in your policy on what you're supposed to do when an attack happens. Then afterwards, find out everything that happened. Post attack forensics. What are you gonna to do to avoid the future attacks? And then enhance, 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 enhance. You see it all the way down the list. You need to build on what you already had in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And then the last bullet, reevaluate cybersecurity insurance. You're gonna be looking at cybersecurity insurance before, and you're gonna be reevaluating it after. And I put this here, and I put big dollar signs on it for a reason, but everything has a cost. You're all financial people, you understand it. Just understand nothing's free and you're gonna to have to find ways to fund this the right way. Okay. All right, I think it's a good segue into doing some last Q&A uh, for, for everyone here. I know that there are some resources that will be made available to you by GFOA, including the NASIO report that Phil mentioned. Uh, Phil also wrote an article that is in the April 2020 edition of the Government Finance Review on uh, cyber attacks and, and uh, how to be ready if you're hit with a cyber attack. So you definitely wanna check that out. And then uh, GeoFoy also put out a great guide on uh, called a bite of prevention, which is best practices in cybersecurity. So you'll get all of those resources as well to kind of go through it. But what we wanna do in our last nine minutes together is just answer some of your questions about where to start. Uh, so, like Phil, we'll go with the first one around uh, finance officials that are just beginning. So, for finance officials that are just beginning their journey, um, what's the best way for them to get up to speed quickly? Yeah, they, they should immediately schedule a meeting with their head of technology, whomever that may be, and if it's a provider, the provider. And you find out the best way that you can get some information. And the GFOA is an excellent resource. As I mentioned earlier, GovTech.com is an excellent resource. And you can also reach out to your peers because there are peers out there that have great experience with all of this and can help you get what you need. Great. Uh, next question, are you seeing finance officers partner with other jurisdictions on cybersecurity policies, procedures, and risk mitigation tactics? That's an interesting question, Dustin, because I know that technology people tend to look across jurisdictions and try to partner on certain things. Finance officers, I believe, are starting to do that. I've, I've given a number of talks at the GFOA conferences, and there's so much peer-to-peer -peer interaction and best practices that are being shared at the conference that I do believe that people are looking at it and they're talking to each other. The question is, do they believe that the person they're working with has the requisite experience to help them get what they need? I think that's where the GFOA can help them. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely tap into some of those other groups that are out there as well. You may think MSI sucks just for the CIOs. You know, it's a good place to at least get, you know, email newsletters or other types of things to kind of keep up with, with all of those things. All right, here's an audience question here around how safe are vendor supplier portals? Should bank information be changed by the supplier through the city's supplier portal? I can take a first crack at that one. Sure. I mean, I think everything has an inherent risk associated with it. I think, you know, even city supplier portals can inherently be uh, hacked. You know, let's say the, the vendor's information is compromised, someone logs in with their login, they change the information, you don't even realize that. 
So, so I think, you know, I almost look at this through kind of a multi-factor login thing, right? Like if you log into your bank and you haven't logged into your bank before, it's going to ask you if you have multi-factor authentication turned on, it's going to say, you know, hey, we're going to email you or text you a code, enter that. So city systems really need to look at leveraging the same thing. You don't want to make it hard for people to, um, to be able to engage with you, but certain things like financial information and, and changing, you know, direct deposit information, you want to put in place a series of checks and balances to validate that that was uh, a legitimate request because so many organizations are getting hit with that type of an attack today. So that's one I would make sure that you're watching and that uh, you're verifying with more than just an email login to a supplier portal to change that information. Phil, anything you'd add from your, your standpoint? Yeah, Dustin, you nailed it. I, I, I do think there are, you know, we always talk about automation and we talk about trying to do things digitally, but this is a time where people should control a process too. And that nothing should happen. There shouldn't be bank account changes. There shouldn't be direct deposit changes made without some sort of physical verification of what took place. All right, here's a question around how much insurance uh, amount should organizations have? Um, any, any thoughts on that one, Phil? Yeah, I guess it depends on your size. And there's no rule of thumb, like if you're this big, you have this much insurance. I think it comes down to what systems are you operating? How much personal data and health data and financial data do you have? And what would be the cost of, of mitigating that? So maybe work with your CIO and work with some, maybe your state, to talk to them about what they've seen out there in the marketplace as far as hacks and costs and try to create some sort of financial model that you can start with. And it may change over time, but at least you have something to work from. Yeah, I think that's good. Definitely work with your, like if you get insurance from a pool or a, a league of cities, they'll have kind of their own way of calculating that. But remember, whatever that amount is, it's probably ultimately not going to be enough. It's more of a, a nice to have thing that definitely will, you know, help mitigate some of the risks. But if you look at the average cybersecurity attack from a cost standpoint, it can be significantly higher than most cyber insurance policies. So it's important not to just think that that's blanket coverage for anything that comes. You can still have risk above and beyond that policy cap. All right, next question. Um, how would you advise officials and agencies that are smaller and think the cyber risk are relatively low for them? <laughs> That's a great question because it's all relative. It's what, what people understand and what they see. And one of the ways that I would do it is I'd make it personal. How many times have they had their email account hacked or if they're on social media, how many times has their account been jeopardized? or has anyone ever falsified something on their credit card and their credit card company had to send them a new credit card? Try to make it as personal as possible to them and then say, oh, hey, put that on steroids. That's what we have in our vaults. We have personally identifiable information for our taxpayers, our citizens, our people that have gone through our health systems, and we need to make sure that we keep that secure. So try to bring, make it personal and then broaden it out to what you're trying to accomplish. Yep, and then I think the only thing I'd add to that is just remember that regardless of your size, you are still a target. And sometimes the smaller ones are even easier to attack because they may not have a dedicated chief information security officer. And so it's it's one way that uh, that you know attackers are kind of looking at that as a starting point. So so you're you're not immune based on your size. If someone wants to get in, they're going to find a way to to try to uh, to disrupt. Uh, next question: uh, How are you seeing agencies? fund their cybersecurity initiatives? That's difficult too, because everybody's budget is pretty much spoken for back when they do budget prep. And it depends on whether you have a single year or a multi-year budget. So you could have budgets locked up for two to three years at a time. It's time to make the tough choices where you have to look at some of the programs or projects you have underway, some of the funding that's associated with it and see what you can get out and, and try to make, repurpose for cybersecurity. But at the same time, if you have any uh, play in your fund equity, where you may have some things set aside for future spending, that instead of maybe a physical asset, you go with a, a digital asset because that's the competition. Do I fix roads? Do I put new windows in my buildings? Or do I, do I secure our cyber posture? So I think there's a lot of ways to look at it. 
but you're going to have to make the tough decisions. Getting money out of your citizens to do cybersecurity would be almost impossible, and you can't really bond for it because it's a technology. So you're going to have to find ways to maybe fund some of your physical assets and repurpose that money towards your cyber assets. Yeah, and I think, you know, remember that cybersecurity is an ongoing investment, so it's going to be something that is not a one-time kind of one-and-done thing. You can't treat it as just a capital expense. Um, it's something that's operationally going to have to be diffused through, through your organization. Uh, you know, there are a variety of, of other resources that are out there that you can look at. Um, you know, there's grants available to smaller municipalities. I know some of the resources that we'll have sent out by GFOA uh, include some federal resources resources, including cyber assessments that the federal government will help you with, um, and some good frameworks for that. So, so definitely check those things out. Um, and then, you know, look for ways to also partner with other organizations and other, you know, agencies. So we're seeing a lot of managed services around this. And I know, Bill, you in Oakland County, you know, you were really a champion for for working with other jurisdictions that didn't have the means of doing that. So that could be, you know, potentially a, a future way of, of getting around some of the upfront costs. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, I'll put, I'll put a plug in for our stuff too. the center for digital government. We do some events for city, county and state CIOs that where we're trying to share as much information as we can. And, you know, one of the ways to, to do that is to look at your larger communities in your state and see if there's some sharing you can do because that's what we did. We played the role of we helped as many people as we could and as many governments as we could, and we didn't care if they were in the state of Michigan or not, and that's what you want. All right, well, I know we are at the top of the hour, so I just want to thank you all and, and thanks to Phil for, for also joining, for hanging with us for two hours as we dove into the world of cybersecurity, cybercrime, and, and all of the risk associated with it. And, you know, special thanks to GFOA for giving us a, a platform to have this conversation. If you've got questions or, you know, anything after the fact, we'll make sure that our email addresses are sent out to you. Uh, but really appreciate you hanging in uh, with us for uh, for this two-hour block. We had a lot of fun, and hopefully you, you learned a little bit about what's happening in the cyber landscape around state and local government.